So, how did it happen? Well, actually, that's a really important question. The two countries were essentially enemies. That is, of course, an allegation that has been levelled. Everybody had a different definition of what the problem was. Let's remember the background of all these. This is The Explanation from the BBC World Service. I'm Claire Graham, and with the help of my BBC colleagues around the world, I'll be trying to get a better understanding of the stories that matter to all of us. In this episode, why is gang warfare widespread in Haiti? Located between the Caribbean Sea and the North Atlantic Ocean, Haiti neighbours Jamaica to the west and Cuba to the northwest. I'm joined from Haiti's capital city, Port-au-Prince, by journalist Harold Isaac. Harold, thanks for joining us. All right. So, Harold, Haiti won its independence from France in 1825, but it paid a big price. 100 million francs, approximately $21 billion in today's money. It's estimated that over half of Haiti's population is living in poverty. Is this in some way a legacy of that colonial debt? For the most part, what it made sure, uh, and and this was the long game, if you want, or or the long con of sorts, it made sure that it crippled Haiti for the foreseeable future, for a, a very durable time. It made sure that Haiti would become the poorest country of the Americas, if not one of the poorest country in the world. It also lay out the foundations and the blueprint for the uh, financial system in, in, in Africa, because the same model that was developed in Haiti was eventually used for all what they call the um, French West Africa uh, uh, French. And, and the CFA franc is virtually born out of that logic of what is considered as neocolonialism or neoliberalism. So a new form of imperialism without, you know, physical chains and without guns and other kind of, you know, physical constraints. So Haiti's history in the world is a history of struggle. Many people will associate Haiti in recent times with that earthquake in 2010. Mm -hmm. What was the lasting effect of that earthquake The cruel irony for the earthquake that happened in 2010, and there are many points that are ironic with regards to that earthquake. The first is is Haiti itself. Haiti bears three names, uh, Haiti, Kiskeya, or Boyo. They all native words because there are many, you know, native people before the arrival of settlers and before the arrival of slaves. Haiti means mountain land. And as such, the very history of the country is a history of tectonic shifts. I mean, 95% of the territory of Haiti is mountains. So as such, it it has known throughout its geological history, earthquakes. The earthquakes that struck Haiti most vividly also had major political consequences. One of them was the uh, earthquake of May 7th, 1842, that led eventually because back then the the island was one country, uh, both Haiti and the Dominican Republic were one country. The Dominican Republic was under Haitian rule at that time. And that earthquake accelerated and led to the birth of the Dominican Republic. An earthquake just happened and many people are walking in front of me and they have blood all over. That was a lady screaming because she lost her son. In just 35 overwhelming seconds, the earthquake destroyed lives, homes and the heart of Haiti's government. On January 12th, 2010, a massive earthquake struck Haiti, devastating Port-au-Prince and killing over 200,000 people. The 2010 earthquake happened at the time where Haiti was in a political crisis, a social crisis, an economic crisis. It's a big country physically compared to other you know, small islands, but it's a small country in terms of the people. So virtually everybody knows everybody. And that day, many folks died and the country was propelled for the next 10 years in kind of a tailspin. On the streets of Port-au-Prince, there was panic and fear. Some casualties were rescued, 
but others, too many to count, were buried alive beneath the rubble. At the presidential palace, proof of the strength of this earthquake, it wasn't just flimsy buildings which collapsed. The central cathedral caught fire. It now lies in ruins. But it is the human losses which are most shocking. Throughout the night, desperate survivors tried to rescue their family, their friends, in whatever way they could, digging down with bare hands. Politically, Haiti was in very troubled times and was on the uh, onset of trying a very problematic experience politically with, with a newcomer that had no experience whatsoever in politics and that propelled the country in major crises that we're paying the price of until today. When the earthquake struck, one of the major problems that happened at, at, at the same time was what would be happening with elections that were set to happen in 2011. And in, actually, in the end of 2010, for 2011, people were saying, well, you know, the, the country is traumatized. Yes, there is a president. Back then, it was President Preval. His term was about to end. The international community really pressed for elections to happen. President Preval, back then, I think, believed that it was necessary, but thought that, you know, we have lost nearly 300,000 people. Are we really going to be in the mindset for elections? What ended up happening there were serious allegations during these elections about the credibility of the election, whether there was fraud, and one of the main candidates. And one of the accusations that was made towards him is that he got bumped up by the uh, international community. He was supposed to be fifth, and then he was brought up to be runner-up, and he ended up winning. And that person was Michel Martelli. He was a singer that has zero political experience, but he came precisely on that mandate saying that he's different than traditional politicians, he's going to shake up things. And <laughs> so there was this wave, you know, what they call the pink wave that carried him into power. The hopes of a nation rest on his shoulders. Michel Martelly arriving for his inauguration as Haiti's new president. The pop star turned politician promised a fresh start after the devastating earthquake in January last year. Mr. Martelly is an outsider with no experience of government. His fame and message of change won him the election. But Haiti's faced political upheavals, coups and violence for decades. Overcoming that legacy and rebuilding this shattered country will be a huge challenge. Initially, because there was a lot of money flowing in, whether it's international aid, whether it's the Petrocaribe loan program from Venezuela, that made an ambience of lavish expenses from the government, which was unusual really for Haiti because it's not a rich country, but it was in a situation where they, they didn't have any cap to their expenses. So they could just tap into the loan program and get money and spend it whichever way they wanted. And then what it ended up happening is five years went, went by, almost four to five years, and we were back at the election cycles in 2016, and he had a problem because he couldn't extend his term because as per the Haitian constitution, you cannot have two consecutive terms uh, as a president. And so he needed to tap someone to run for him in the election. He ended up tapping an entrepreneur called Jovenel Moise, who initially was considering running for Senate, but it ended up being his choice, his pick for his party, which was the Tetkali party, which is uh, the ball head party for literal translation. And it eventually, in 2017, he got sworn in and became president. Jovenel Moïse, as a president, displayed very little regards for institutions and for institutions renewal. During his term, he just let the terms expired for every branches until it got to him. Because in February 7th, 2021, his term, in theory, was supposed to be expired. He no longer had a parliament. He no longer had a justice system that was functioning. All the terms had virtually expired. So on July 5th, he tapped current Prime Minister Ariel Henry to replace another ad interim Prime Minister he had that was Claude Joseph. And literally two days later, he got killed. Haiti is a country in chaos, where acts of everyday life have come to pose a mortal risk. 
Accused of corruption and extending his presidency illegally, Jovenel Moyes faced mass protests and demands from the opposition to step down. Application. The interim prime minister described the assassination, which came after weeks of escalating violence, as a heinous, inhuman and barbaric act and declared a state of emergency. Still recovering from the devastating earthquake of 2010 and a hurricane that struck six years later, parts of the country remain inaccessible, besieged by territorial battles between heavily armed gangs, violence that's forced more than 13,000 to flee their homes. Yet the police have been largely invisible, the government silent. The shooting of the president and his wife, proof that no one is safe. The assassination of Haiti's president plunged the country into further chaos. The power vacuum created by his death was soon filled by an upsurge in the gang warfare that plagued the region. Do we know how many gangs are operating in Haiti at the moment? The gang reality was here in Haiti for virtually eons. It's just that they were localized, they were contained, they were not emboldened with powerful weapons and, and a constant flux of ammunition coming in, and their territory was very restricted. What happened is the UN mission, the MINUSTA mission that had been there since 2004, started departing in 2017, 2018. And from that point on, gangs were virtually emboldened in expanding. Police evicting families from a public square in Port-au-Prince. Many sought refuge here in July when gang warfare killed at least 300 people in 10 days. They've had little help from their failing state. Here's where they fled from, City Soleil a place where most fear to tread. It's the poorest part of the capital and a bastion of the gangs. The UN's World Food Programme has to negotiate its way in to give out life-saving aid. It says 19,000 people here are facing famine-like conditions, a two-hour flight from Miami. The gang problem is ongoing in Haiti. It's, and some people argue that gangs are as old as the country itself because it's uh, it's all about local folks deciding that they are imposing their own rules to certain neighborhoods, certain areas. It is estimated today that there's roughly 200 gangs, but there are like, you know, at least a dozen that are really powerful. So it's considered that 80% of the metropolitan area of Port-au-Prince is controlled by gangs. What happened is during the term of Jovenel Moïse, the UN mission, the MINUSTA mission that had been there since 2004, started departing in 2017, 2018, gangs were sprawling throughout the city. And essentially, they broke into two major movements. One is called the G9, infamously known internationally for its gruesome methods and atrocities and massacres. And then on the opposite side, you have the GPEP, which contains, you know, folks like uh, Izo and Timakak and uh, Vitalam and, and whatnot. And these gangs have been in turf wars with each other, but their methods are different. Some are more specialized into kidnapping. Some are more specialized into racketeering businesses and whatnot. Gang warfare often erupts here in broad daylight. Why not? Gunmen are in league with corrupt politicians and have some police on the payroll. This is gang territory in Port-au-Prince, almost as far as the eye can see. But it seems the world isn't looking. It's morning in a middle-class suburb. Minutes after a shootout, a show of force by the police. But usually it's the gangs who call the shots. And the Haitian capital has become a gangster's paradise. Some of the gangs try to give themselves some sort of a political agenda. You're going to fight against powerful people and whatnot. But this is the narrative they sell to folks that they need to use as a support system. And then eventually, when they grow, they need more weapons, they need more ammunition, and then they turn into full-blown criminals that need to kidnap or racket businesses so that they can supply themselves with weapons. But that narrative 
has been challenged with an incident that happened in Port-au-Prince where a group of alleged gangsters fleeing from the old stronghold of Timakak, which is a gang leader that has been confirmed killed by the police. They were fleeing and they got caught at a police stop and then a violent mob came and lynched and burned them to death. That sent shockwaves because the the gangs had a, a sort of invincibility veneer where they expanded their territory, taking over new territories, and it felt like there was no end to it and that they would, they would just expand forever and just take over the whole country and, and kick everybody out, you know. But that was challenged, and automatically many neighborhoods in the capital started to challenge them with machetes, with, with rocks, and it's very gruesome scenes, but it was a reaction to their expansion and a challenge to their rule. Because a new player got onto the field, and it's called the Sovereign People. It's vigilante justice, and that has shaken the very foundations of the gangs. How does Haiti get out of this? Does it need an international intervention? Haiti is facing a complex set of crises, whether it is natural disaster, whether it's sanitary crisis with a cholera re- resurgence, whether it's a political or social economic. So for everyday folks here in Haiti, it is a challenge. And being here by itself is an act of resistance, you know, considering all the woes that Haitians have to face. We have everything to thrive, right? It's just that we're lacking opportunities. We're lacking a support to do things. The the, the matter of the international intervention has been very polarizing in Haiti. However, with the intervention of, you know, what we call the sovereign people. It showed that, you know, when cornered, the population will react and it will be unpredictable and it will be without mercy. And in reality, those who are expressing this rage or this disapproval, you know, of of gangsterism, they just want to live. They want to go to school. They want to make a living. They want that's what they're looking to do. And that's where perhaps they need help. You've been listening to The Explanation from the BBC World Service. I'm Claire Graham and my guest was Harold Isaac. And if you'd like to hear more episodes of The Explanation, subscribe at BBC Sounds or wherever you get your BBC podcasts.